Good morning again. Let's, uh, let's give Tim and his team another round of applause. Thanks, you. We praise God for having, having him and his team here today. It's wonderful. I also want to remind those of you who, if you didn't get a chance to, if you could pick up those friendship pads and just go ahead and pass them down the road. We certainly want to know that you're here with us this morning. As you can see, um, we have a, we're, in the, we're starting a new sermon series today uh, called Proving Jesus, Why Following Christ Makes Sense. And I love the, that video intro we just saw there. I thought that was fun. Uh, this series... Actually, in, in some ways, the series actually puts Jesus on trial. Uh, the question is, is there evidence that this man could possibly be the Messiah? Could he possibly be the Savior of the world? And so in this next several Sundays, we'll be asking a, a question. And on trial today is the question, are the Gospels credible witnesses of Christ? So this morning our text comes from 2 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy, this is the, the second letter written by Paul to whom? Timothy. Timothy, that's right. Yeah, it's kind of a trick question. So just, you know. Anyway, so uh, Paul wrote this to Timothy. Paul at the time was uh, later in his career. As a matter of fact, he was in prison at this time. He'd been in prison several times. This is near the end of his life. He's uh, writing from prison to Timothy. And Timothy uh, is a young man in charge of the church at Ephesus. So really, this is kind of a, a mentor's letter to, uh, to Timothy. And so if you read throughout the book, you'll see this wonderful advice that Paul gives this young leader, uh, fledgling leader in the church in Ephesus. So we're going to take a look at this passage today. Uh, this is going to come from Timothy, the third chapter. Uh, but before we do, please pray with me that God would illuminate his word into our lives. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the word we're about to receive right now. We thank you for uh, what you have for us as we kind of eavesdrop uh, on this conversation between Paul and Timothy. We know, Lord, that this is a conversation actually for us today. And so as we uh, take a peek into this, uh, into this word that we know is from you, God, we pray that you would do your work by the Holy Spirit, uh, enlivening our lives through your word. And we know that you're going to do this because we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, this is 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 through 17. Let's listen to God's word for us. Paul says, Now you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and suffering, the things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. <clears throat> what persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But wicked people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> this past week I learned about Uncle Oscar. Uncle Oscar was an elderly gentleman who uh, had never flown on a plane before. That is not until recently. See, Uncle Oscar wanted to fly to his grandson's graduation, and he was so worried about flying that he was talking and debating with his friends about whether or not he should even go. Could he trust flying on this plane at all? And he talked and debated with his friends, and finally he forced himself to get on that plane, and he went on this trip to see his, his grandson's graduation. And when he returned back, all of his friends wanted to know how the flight went, how he fared on this flight. And uh, he, so Uncle Oscar told his friends, he said, well, it wasn't as bad as I thought. But I'll tell you this, I never did put all my weight down. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we often uh, struggle with scripture like that. Like Uncle Oscar, 
how he treats planes. We, we may use scripture, but we never put all our weight down on it. Paul tells Timothy in his mentoring letter here to put his weight on scripture because it is theonustos. Theonustos. That's a Greek word. Say that with me. Theonustos. Now, theonustos uh, literally is, uh, it, it's, it, well, it's translated for us as inspired by God. But the word theonustos literally is theo, meaning God, and eustos, meaning breath or spirit. God breathes is what that word really is. As a matter of fact, some Bibles, maybe your Bible has it translated as God, all scripture is God breathed. It's inspired. And inspire literally means, the word inspire literally means to breathe into someone, to inspire, to fill them with spirit or breath. All scripture is filled with the breath spirit of God, is inspired by God. So Paul encourages Timothy to put his full weight down on Scripture because it breathes Jesus Christ. And the clearest depiction that we have of Christ is in those four biographies that we have. Maybe you've read one of them, maybe all of those four biographies. We call them the Gospels. They are, and you can name them with me, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's right. Those are Jesus' biographies, okay, in Scripture. It's easy to say now. It's easy to say that they're God-breathed. But are they accurate? Can we trust what they say about Jesus Christ? So if Scripture is only this feel-good inspiration, it's not worth suffering for, right? I mean, Paul, like Paul did, and Paul suffered for it, and he encouraged Timothy to suffer for it. I have to tell you, if I have to suffer for something, then it better be true. Otherwise, it's, it's just not worth it. So it's only responsible for us to ask, can a thinking person believe what the Bible says about Jesus Christ? Or is it merely just chicken soup for the soul inspiration? Can we put our full weight down on the Gospels or are we being like Uncle Oscar? <clears throat> I don't know if you know, I love this stuff. Uh, Elon Musk, if you know him, he announced a month ago that his company SpaceX, how many of you have heard of SpaceX? Any of you? Isn't that cool? So SpaceX, they plan to fly two private citizens around the moon in its uh, Dragon spacecraft this, uh, in, 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 in this next year. As a matter of fact, I have a picture for you to see it. There's a picture, that's the picture of the Dragon spacecraft right there with Elon Musk standing in front of it. I wish that was me standing in front of it. But. You see, SpaceX will publicly reveal who these private citizens are after they pass their initial health and fitness test. But these two citizens, they have already paid large deposits of money for their spot on this week-long flight around the moon. The Dragon, I've learned, is a fully automated spacecraft. And so these two individuals will be the only two people on board this spacecraft. And uh, Elon Musk says that he hopes that this will get people excited about going actually out into deep space. Isn't this amazing? Would you, okay, raise your hand if you would want to do this, this week-long trip around the moon. Oh yeah, good, okay. Yes, okay, that's awesome. I have to say, I would love that. In theory. <laughs> I have to say, I don't know about you, but if I went on the Dragon spacecraft around the moon, I would need absolute and complete trust in the engineers who built that ship, who programmed it before putting my full weight down on that spacecraft. Trusting the Dragon is a life and death matter. How stinking cool! <laughs> You see, friends, trusting the Gospels like that is a life and death risk of eternal magnitude 
even more than trusting the Dragon spacecraft. It's far more than that. You see, Christians actually stake their lives on the reliability of the Gospels to know Jesus Christ. If we think searching the Scriptures shows us the Savior, the stakes are too high to not test them out. Can we put our full weight down on the Gospels or are we like Uncle Oscar? So, as an exercise this morning, let's just for the moment, just for the moment, let's set aside our faith. And let's analyze the Gospels as we would any ancient document. Okay, now uh, there are five internal and four external criteria for verifying text reliability. Now hang with me, I'm going to make nine points here and they're going to go really fast. So, uh, you this morning will be my outline, alright? Our right hand is the internal criterion and our left hand will be our external criterion, okay? This will be fast. Ready? Here we go. There are five internal criteria analyzing elements within the document for reliability. So, raise number one on your right hand. Come on, come on. Good, thank you. Okay, great. The first internal criterion is the author's credibility on the subject written. Okay? So John explicitly states that he was an eyewitness. Luke states that he is recording direct eyewitness testimony. Now, neither Matthew nor Mark say whether or not they are eyewitnesses, and yet they write from unique eyewitness perspectives. So the, the gospel authors appear to be credible. Okay, two fingers on your right hand. See, okay, this is the second. The second internal criterion is the presence of specific and irrelevant material. All right? The Gospels are filled with irrelevant detail that only accompanies eyewitness accounts. In the resurrection story, for example, John includes irrelevant factors like the time of day, like who reached the tomb first, and the irrelevant, and I would say even, even negative, lack of faith of the characters in the story. And there are many other beside the point elements. So these rambling and specific and pointless details add nothing to the storyline except that it is simply what happened. Fabricated accounts don't do this. Okay, raise three fingers on your right hand. Good. The third internal criteria is the presence of self-sabotaging material. Okay, when persuading an audience, you, you don't want to include contrary evidence. Yet the gospel contains self-damaging content. You see, the disciples, if you've read them, you know the disciples are depicted as clueless. Also, in that time, women were not considered credible witnesses, and yet they are the primary witnesses to the resurrection. Details about Jesus' life are included that, that threaten his perception by people as divine. For example, I mean, there's many examples, but for example, he cried out on the cross, My God, why have you forsaken me? Friends, you don't include contrary and even embarrassing material unless, of course, it actually happened. <laughs> okay, now raise four on your right hand. The fourth internal criterion is the consistency between the different texts. You see, the Gospels were written by four different authors at different times, and while the Gospels do differ in some details, the character and the intent and the description of Jesus is absolutely consistent. If these were fabricated stories, there would be wildly different versions of who Jesus is and was. Okay, raise five fingers on your right hand. Here we go. The final internal criterion is the presence of legendary exaggeration. Are Jesus' miracles legends? You see, legendary texts of that time had a style and a language that the Gospels do not. These texts do not have that mythical attributes required to be legend at the time. And the writers at that time could not have created what we call now our modern novelistic narratives 2,000 years before that style was even created. You see, no such text existed back then like that. So the Gospels are not legend. 
And the Gospels there stand up to those five internal criteria. Okay, now, now there are four external criteria. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. And these analyze the elements outside of the document for reliability. Okay, hold up number one on your left hand. Okay. The first external criterion is the author's motive for fabricating falsehoods. Friends, the gospel writers had, they gained nothing from creating a fiction. As a matter of fact, they actually suffered for it. They wrote these texts because they actually experienced Jesus' miracles and resurrection. They knew his life. They heard his teachings. An author would not create a personally life-threatening story unless it were true. Okay, two fingers. Oops, on your left hand. There you go. The second external criterion would be outside sources confirming the material. Okay, so the Gospels are validated by many outside sources at that time, such as, you can write these down if you want to look them up, such as Tacitus, Suetonius, maybe you've heard of Josephus, and Thallus. These were all so these first, mid first, and even some second century writings, as well as there are other ancient writings opposing even Christianity. And surprisingly, the Gospels are confirmed by their unrelated, contemporary, outside sources. Okay, hold up three fingers in your left hand. You still with me? Yeah, okay, good, good. Not too many yawns. Okay, three fingers on your left hand. The third is the archaeological corroboration. While when archaeologists discover artifacts contradicting scripture, which they've seen, frankly, time and time again, further discovery then reverses some of these findings. For example, you know the story of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. It says that Jesus' birth occurred while Quirinius was governor. Right? It says Quirinius was governor of Syria. But we found it from other sources that Quirinius started governing around 6 AD. That would have been after Jesus' birth. However, not too long ago, we've since discovered that 6 AD was Quirinius' second reign. And he likely did reign during Jesus' birth. You see, there are plenty of archaeological finds that actually substantiate the Gospels and none appear to conclusively refute them. Okay, so hold up four fingers on your left hand. Ready? The final external criterion is the presence of contemporary opponents who would have, if they could have, proven the document false. You see, Christianity began in an extremely hostile environment with influential enemies. They had enemies in the government, in religion, in politics, and countless opponents at the time longed to disprove the gospel accounts, but they couldn't. Innumerable leaders wanted to, wanted to prove that Jesus didn't do miracles or rise from the dead, but they couldn't. So no matter how desperately they wanted to dismantle the Gospels, they only ended up affirming them. Okay, so the Gospels stand up to the five internal and four external criterion, if we were to analyze them as a document. Nice work, thank you. So now, let me hear you on that, on that grounds. Can a thinking person believe in the Bible? Yes. yes. Do the Gospels verify Jesus? Yes. Are they credible witnesses? Yes. yes. Friends, searching the Scriptures shows us the Savior. Say that with me. Searching the Scriptures shows us the Savior. But... Will we put our full weight down on the Gospels? Or are we like Uncle Oscar? Harold Myra is an author who shared a story about his pastor named Bob Harvey. Early in Pastor Bob's ministry, actually right out of seminary, a close friend of his died. And in an effort to comfort the widow, also a close friend of his, Bob shared all the seminary textbook explanations of how and why God might have let this happen. He wanted to help her rationally understand God's purposes in the midst of her grief. And in the midst of him trying to do this, this the young woman cried out between her tears, I don't need a God like that. I don't, I don't need to understand this. What I need is a God who is bigger than my mind. I want a God I can trust with my life. So 
So are we willing to put our full weight, not just our minds, but our entire lives, on the gospel claims about Jesus Christ? Searching the scriptures shows us the Savior. Now let's trust the Savior, Jesus Christ, with our lives. Following Christ makes sense. I mean, the stakes are so high, it's a life and death matter. Christ saves and changes lives. Friends, I have to tell you, all over the world, people are connecting with this unstoppable power found in the Gospels, which is God's breath. God breathes. The scripture is God breathes with Christ himself. He transforms lives. He overturns the world's hate and grief and war, replacing it with love and joy and peace. Friends, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are credible witnesses proving Jesus by changing lives. Remember, searching the scriptures shows us the Savior. But, you ask, why are there conflicts between the Gospels? Good question. Come back next Sunday and find the answer. <laughs> Pastor Diane is going to be taking on that topic. And so as I invite the worship team forward, I, I want you to remember, this trial today asked, are the Gospels credible witnesses of Jesus Christ? The answer is yes. Searching the scriptures shows us the Savior. And so remember, the best way for proving Jesus is experiencing him yourself. Because following Christ just makes sense. When you do follow him, when you do, you will find you are proving Jesus with your life. Amen. Amen.